And with floating, I think it's best to consider some very simple exercises before we actually go and apply these thoughts to a real web page. All right. I think with these exercises, we can sort of get an idea of what floating does. And once we get an idea of how exactly how it works, then we can apply it. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, the same thing applies for the other ones as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a very simple page, all right? And we're going to use no layout control. That is, just let the flow do it, all right? We're going to use then absolute positioning. We're going to use relative positioning. Then we'll get, we'll get into fixed positioning too, maybe. And then finally, we're going to get into um, floating. So in this example, um, just for simplicity's sake, so I can only have a one file open at a time, uh, I'm, I'm just going to put the style sheet as part of the file. All right. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that that's a good idea to do if you're developing a, a website. It, it just means that for this demonstration purposes. So let me go start out and let me just make a page with two blocks on it. Why does it keep using the wrong value for pi? I said, why does it keep using the wrong value for pi? I mean, if they use pi, it No, no, no. That is so not true. <laughs> Look it up where. On I make crap up dot com or where? <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, Mr. Yes. Bacon. Okay. All right. Exactly. Ham, jerky, tenderloin, bacon. Okay. I'm going to put these in two sections. I'm going to put. I'm going to copy the same text twice. So, no CSS whatsoever. I'm just going to save this as, save it on the desktop, save it as flow.html. Okay, we look at that, that's what we get. All right. I'm actually going to open it up in Chrome because I'm not going to bother putting in the um, HTML file. All right, so block tags, they appear right on top of each other. Their default width is 100% of the available space. 
we make it smaller, it gets, each line gets smaller and it and extends down. And that's the way it is. We can go in, and I'm going to go in and add a little bit of style to this. So that we can identify the two different sections. I'm going to do it via an ID. All right, and there we go. All right, now we know we can do things with the width, so I can make the width either a fixed amount or a relative amount. Or I can say width to 80%. All right, the one doesn't move, the other one does move. We can also do something like put a minimum width here. So it will move but never get smaller than a certain amount, certain size. So it moves and then it gets locked in at a certain size. All right, that's pretty much all we can show with flow. All right, flow means it puts it one after another. All right, so I'm going to save this as flow, which I already did, I suppose. Now I'm going to go save it as absolute. And with absolute, I'm going to go in and I'm going to give absolute positions All right, just making numbers up here to do that. And if we look at it, the stuff is glued down there, all right, in the top and the left. In other words, this one is 10 from the top, 100 from the left. The other one is 400 from the top, 600 from the left. And I think the widths are still adjustable on the one, but other than that, those things are frozen in position. All right? They're not going to move. So that is absolute positioning. I'm going to use fixed positioning next. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, instead of position absolute, position fixed on this guy. Which starts off looking the same, but as I scroll down the page, whoops, oh, I'm still looking at absolute.
starts out looking the same, but as I scroll down the page, that guy stays locked in that position. Whereas in this case, this guy does not. In the case of the absolute, it didn't stay. So what's the difference between absolute and fixed? Absolute is based on the top corner, the, if you want to consider it that, the top left corner of the web page. And even if it scrolls off the, off the page, it's still based on that. All right? Whereas fixed is based on the visible portion of the web page. So if I say the difference between 10 fixed and 10 absolute is that 10 fixed means it'll be 10 pixels from the top of the visible space. And as, of, as I scroll and that visible space changes, that stays in the same position. Whereas with absolute, it's based on the top corner of the web page. And when that scrolls off the screen, things move up then. All right? So that's the difference between those two. All right? Third thing we're going to do, or I lost count by now, whatever the next thing is. We're going to do relative. And remember, with relative, whenever you talk about relative, it's relative to what? And in the case of this, it's relative to where the flow would have put it anyhow. So, let's get rid of our positioning. All right, we have that. The flow says that they're both block tags that get st stacked on top of each other. So if we wanted to move this to be up next to that, we could do that by saying, I want it over whatever the width is of this and up whatever the height is of that. So I could look and I could play around with that. I want the position to be relative and I'm going to say top 250px negative 250px rather left 250px so what this is going to do is it's going to take where the flow wanted to put this, and it's going to adjust it by going up 250 and then to the left 250. So we'll save that. Oh, yeah. Position relative. There we go. That's a you know, if, if we talk using the validator to find the problem. In other words, what I had is I had a colon here instead of a semicolon. So my style rule partly worked, but partly didn't work. So you can either eyeball it like I did, and you know, it, but if it doesn't stick out to you, then you can go run it through the validation. Go and now we have that over there. And again, as we resize this, it's like that. All right. That brings us to the star of today's presentation, floating. All right. Floating in a nutshell works like this. And you can float in four directions, left, top, right, bottom. Typically, floating happens either left or right. And, and most all the time that I do the float, I float to the left. All right. What floating does is it says that it, it looks to see if there's enough room to put the thing side by side. If there is, it will do it. If it doesn't, it will drop it down, down below. 
So it's sort of a combination of sort of like the relative positioning and flow sort of merged together. So in other words, let's imagine my window size. Let's imagine my window is currently 800 pixels wide. And I have two blocks. One of them is 300 pixels, and one of them is 300 pixels. If I allow, all right, first one comes in, gets pushed over to the left. Next one, push it over to the left. It looks to see if there's room on the same line to put this. And in this case, there is, because I have a total of 800 pixels. 300 means that there is enough to push this one in next to it. So it will. If screen small, 700 pixels, still enough room. 600 pixels, well, counting my adding and all that, there's still barely enough room. 50 pixels though, then there's no put this guy along will drop. So let's go and let's let's create this. Let me get rid of all this stuff. And I'll create both of them as a width of 300 pixels. Just like we went over in the example. And for both of them, I'm going to say float left. Oops. All right. So, uh, let me save this as All right. As is stated, our window size is probably around 700 pixels around now, give or take. And this is 300, this is 300. So, shoves this to the left, it fits in nicely there. It shoves this one in, it tries to shove it in from the left alongside of the one that it follows, and there's enough space for it. So, it can fit in there. So I make this bigger and a little bit smaller, there's always enough space the way I'm sizing it now. All right, because this is probably around seven or eight hundred pixels. Each of these is three hundred, so there's enough to put them put them side by side. So as I slide back and forth, but I hit a certain point, boom, it goes down below. All right. Now that's pretty easy to calculate when you're talking about fixed numbers, right? Where things get to be confusing is when you start adding padding and margin and um, um, doing things based on a percentage rather than that. And if you throw in a minimum width, all those things are things that sort of muddy the water for this. Couple things to remember. First of all, padding and border and margin add to the total width of an element. All right, they call this the CSS box model. There is probably pictures in the book and there's a lot of good pictures online. But if you're talking to the CSS, that if we have a, like a block tag, this is the width. We then have the padding as the space between where the content starts and the border and 
then finally we have the margin. And I just drew it in the one direction, but it goes all four directions going around. Let me see if I can find the... All right, there's the content area. The content area, the space between it and the border is the padding. You then have the border and then you have the margin. So this is especially important when we get into floating because the width simply corresponds to the width of the content. So if I say that the width is 400 pixels or 300 pixels in this case, I'm talking about the width from here to here. All right. When deciding whether it will fit in the float, though, it adds the padding, it adds the border, and it adds the margin. So let's go in and let's add these things together. All right. So let's go and let's put a... padding of 10px. Order twenty X black solid and a margin of twenty PF. Now, notice what the fit before fit anymore. And the padding come into play. So now we get to here. Even though it visually sort of looks like there's enough room there. Um, there isn't because you take into account the padding and the margin and the border. Now we can we can play around with things and we can even do the math on some of these things if we if we want to. And again, keep in mind I'm just doing this sort of as an exercise. I'm not saying that it's going to make for well-designed web pages, but I could do something like this. I could give this a width of 300 pixels, this a width of 30%, let's make it 20%. Let's see what that does for us. All right. Fits it in. But then at a certain point, the total space of the window minus the total space of this does not give this, does not allow for the 20% width of this guy. And again, we could add in like a minimum width and that would muddy the water even further. There it goes and it resizes up to a point, and no, there it goes down. We can actually do like calculations to figure out what like the break point is that it's going to slide over, right? Um, if we know all those all those factors. All right.
Let's go back to a little more simpler situation here. All right. Whereas I go in like this and I say, I'm going to set each of these having a width of 400 pixels. Let's go with 300. I liked those before. Get rid of all this minimum width stuff. Now, something like this can be used very effectively to make an article that is two columns on a wider monitor be one column on a narrow mo uh, monitor. If you notice a lot of times in, in magazines or or books or whatever, newspapers. There's a great magazine, I, I just noticed upstairs, you know, uh, upstairs, um, kind of down the hall from our lab, there's a, a little magazine rack where I, people put magazines that I have no idea where anyone gets them from. But I looked yesterday and I swear I stared at it thinking it was a joke. It's like tunneling magazine. The magazine for building, burrowing under earth and building tunnels. You know, we're talking like for industrial purposes, like big tunnels and stuff. And it's like that, you know, who would think that there would be like a magazine for that? You know, I mean, how many people in the world are interested in that? But I guess enough for a magazine. <laughs> yeah, right, right. If we notice here, a column... A lot of times in articles, things are written in columns. Why is that? Well, because if your eye is going across the page, if, you're going, if you make your eye travel too far distance horizontally, it has the potential to drift up or down a little bit. All right? So if both of these were set at 100% width, well, let's make, a, let's make a, a gigantic, let's make them 900. If you're reading this going across, your eye could have a tendency to go up or down a little bit. All right? Therefore, it's nice to have in columns. So if we do this, we have this in columns. So your eye has less of a tendency, if you can imagine this being an article. Now, if you consider on a mobile phone, there may not be space to put those side by side without sideways scrolling. However, using the float, the mobile phone's width might be something more like this, in which case you read the article as just a single column. One of the things that we'll talk about when we talk about mobile web design, which uh, might be next week if I'm not mistaken, I have to look at my notes, is that Generally speaking, the designs for mobile devices are going to be simpler than the, the designs for um, um, desktop devices. So instead of having multiple columns, you're probably going to have one column. All right? That tends to make it easier for people to, um, to view. All right? So this is a nice consequence of that. And if we went back and we either like downloaded the Opera mobile emulator or we went and resized our browser window to really small sizes, on all the other methods, they're going to look bad, either in the big version, the full size version, or in the mobile version. So one of the keys to mobile development is mastering these liquid or floating um, Floating um, layouts. Questions about this? Now let's go. Oh, one more thing I want to add before we go on to actually doing something with our real example that we did last time. Margins. Margins are different than the other attributes in that margins collapse. All right. 
What do I mean by margins collapse? I mean this. Let's say I have two of these that are side by side. And I specify a margin of 30 pixels for this guy and a margin of 30 pixels for this guy. What is the space between the two of them? They each have a margin of 30 pixels. Yeah, the logical answer would be 60 pixels, right? But no. Space between them is going to be 30 pixels. All right? Why is that? Because 30 pixels satisfies both of those requirements. In other words, this one says, hey, I want, to I want there to be 30 pixels between me and the next guy, between the next block. All right, there's 30 pixels between me and the next block. This one says, I want there to be 30 pixels between me and the next block. There's 30 pixels between them. So margins, unlike those other things, don't add up. All right? Margins say, I want to have this much space between elements. And if both those elements have margins, then as long as the margin requirement is satisfied, they're not going to increment. Now, if I had something like... margin of 40 pixels, margin of 20 pixels, what would the difference be? What would the space between those be? 40 pixels. Because that satisfies this, and 20, yeah, there's at least 20 pixels between this and the other guy. All right? So that's known as margin collapsing. All right? And it can be a little tricky. When, when you're looking at it. Because, again, if you, if you just think of it as incrementing, it ne doesn't necessarily um, do that. All right. So, let's go and let's download the example we had from last time. All right, there's our page with the styling we had on before. So let me go and open up this guy's style sheet. And let's talk about the look that we want to have for this. say we want this kind of look.
than our footer down here. Okay. Here's the CSS. Let me bring up an example of this. Here's what I'd like you to do for the next five minutes. For the next five minutes, write on a sheet of paper what you think the CSS would look like to get the page to have this layout. Header, nav, section, and footer. Using only the floats. Okay? So, puzzle over that. This is what the page looks like. And then I'll be back in a few minutes.
All right, I'm going to run through my solution pretty quick, and you can compare it to yours. Um, do keep in mind that, that for some things it can be done a couple different ways. So um, if you want to try it, try your solution. If, you, if you're convinced that your solution is good and, and even though it's different than mine, then give it a shot in lab. All right, first thing I'm going to do is make an observation. And that observation is I'm going to do all of this by floating things to the left. All right, I'm going to have four float lefts. All right, and what am I going to vary? I'm going to vary the width of things. All right, and the header and the footer are going to have a width of 100%. Let me go all the way across the page. The nav and the section is going to, are going to have widths that probably add up to close to 100%. All right. So, let's look at the CSS here. And I'm going to get rid of some of the rules here. Just going to keep the ones that I want. Header with 100%. Whoops. 1000%. Wow. Float left. We will undoubtedly refine this design in subsequent classes. All right, and we're going to do that. Now, I'm going to do one last thing on the footer. The footer, pretty much regardless of whether there would happen to be space or not, I want to drop down below. So I want to sort of stop the floating, all right, and sort of start anew at that point. So I'm going to say clear both. Clear both the, le the, the vertical and horizontal floating. So if I did this right, it's always up in the air, then what we have is this. All right? And as we make it smaller, It overlaps it. At a certain point, it drops down. Real quick. I could probably take care of some of those issues by putting a minimum width of this guy of 150 pixels, like, let's say. That way, it'll compress, but it will, won't compress past a certain point. Oh, yeah. Now, again, keep in mind I got rid of most of the rest of the styling other than a position. You know, no colors or borders or anything like that. Uh, but if you thought about it, again, this kind of layout on a mobile device, simplistic as it is, is decent, this kind of layout on a desktop device would be respectable, decent, whatever. If you flesh this out with more content and did a little more prettying up with it. All right. Um, when I taught this class however many years ago, let's say five years ago, I told people that, you know, 
it was just, um, how do I want to say it? I, I said there was advantages and disadvantages of all the different kinds of layouts that we studied. Really, now going forward, the mobile is such a factor that you want to become familiar with and comfortable doing the, the, the fluid, flexible, floating layouts. All right. The other ones are kind of, they're important to learn. You might run into a page that has those that you have to make some changes to. They may, there may be some very specialized instances where one of those layouts is required. But your sort of default position would be to make it a fluid layout, all right? And unless you had a really good reason otherwise, all right? Other questions? All right. See you up in line.